Let me show you how just three sentences can make the difference between a B plus and an A minus. Hey everyone, today I wanna to talk about how to help our kids learn to write amazingly powerful concluding paragraphs on their essays. So if this is your first video with me, I'd love it if you paused, go down there and click and watch the how to write an introductory paragraph video because I'm gonna to refer to some things in there that'll be helpful for you to have as background. All right, so concluding paragraphs matter more than our kids think. My kids often, when they first come in, they, you know, they don't give much time or attention to that last paragraph. They just slap a couple sentences in there, hit print and turn it in, usually without even running spell or grammar check. That's a different video for a different day. But that concluding paragraph is actually super important and is often the decider for me as the reader between an essay that's pretty good and an essay that's excellent. Because the concluding paragraph is the, the end note, the long lingering thought that the reader, me, has as I turn the page and start to fill out my content rubric. So I teach my kids a really concrete way. It has three things, three ingredients that make a really strong concluding paragraph. And I'm going to share that with you today. Um, I have a second video. I'm going to queue up here right now. Stay tuned. At the end of that, I actually have two models of strong concluding paragraphs that you're welcome to use. One is for lit analysis and one is for argument. So let's go. All right, we are looking at a skeleton here for the conclusion paragraph format. And I teach my kids to use this whenever we're dealing with literary analysis, argument writing, or research. Narrative, which is the other mode that I teach, obviously this wouldn't fit that, but for those first three modes, this is gonna be a super useful tool. Okay, you're also seeing here that there are three elements involved in creating this paragraph, and each one really could just be one sentence. So all told, the concluding paragraph could just be three sentences, sometimes four. We really don't wanna move beyond five sentences because enough is enough. All right, when we talked about the intro paragraph, and again, that video is available at the link in the descriptions, we talked about that paragraph being a funnel in where we start broad and we get really narrow. And then of course, the conclusion is the funnel out. We start really narrow with the restatement of thesis, and then we go really broad, moving away from the work at hand to talk about more universal truths. Okay, so first up is that restatement using fresh words. So sometimes my kids, when they first come in in the fall semester, they think it's okay just to copy the thesis statement from the end of the intro paragraph and then just paste it into the beginning of their concluding paragraph and no, no, and no, they are not allowed to do that. Um, it creates this super robotic feeling and I want to feel like there's a passionate writer behind the keyboard that created this essay for me. And simple copy and paste of thesis is just a disaster. So I require that they rewrite that idea. It's the exact same idea, but they're just massaging it and using fresh words. Now, sometimes this is really hard for kids. They're like, this is how I would say it. I said it in a thesis. How else am I going to say it? So I actually have a really successful sentence starter here that helps kids over this hump. And I want to give a shout out to my friend Stephanie Kamali back at Amador Valley, I'd say a dozen years ago, she gave me this idea. I'm pretty sure, Steph, that it was you. My memory is not great, but I really think that you're the one who showed this to me. So I'm crediting it to you, whether or not you gave it to me, but I'm like 97.2% sure this was you. So Steph told me that you could actually start it like this. And the sentence starter goes, when one considers blank and blank, it's clear that blah -de blah blah And that's a great way to get kids going. Um, I still use it today and my kids hang on to it because it's super concrete and helpful. You'll see that I actually only use two body paragraphs in my freshman essays. So they actually write four paragraph essays for me because the body paragraphs are pretty involved and I'll deal with that on a different video. Um, if you'd like the five paragraph essay, so you have the three body paragraph topics, you just say when one considers X, Y, and Z. And so you could fold in the three really easily. And I have an example of that a few slides down that I'll show you how this works. Okay, so there you go. They've restated the thesis and then we move on to explaining why any of this matters. Like, why did they write this essay? Why should any of us care? Why was it a good idea for me to spend the last you know, few minutes reading their essay? They should be answering what I call the so what. So what does any of this matter and why should we care? They need one, maybe two sentences explaining the, the bigger consequence of the thing that they've been talking about. And then they wrap it up one awesome, powerful sentence that ends on a weighty note, and that's the kicker, or what we sometimes call the lingering thought. One sentence that just wraps it all up, has a resounding note, makes me glad that I spent my time reading this 
paper. If the kids get stuck on the kicker or they feel like they're just rewriting the same idea as what they wrote in the so what sentence above it, I sometimes encourage kids to try playing with a famous quote as the end note of their essay. That can be a really successful uh, technique and I'll show you that in just a second on the next slide. Um, so whatever they do, uh, they want to end strong. Uh, note on the quote option, uh, two things that my kids kind of mess up when they do the quotes. One, they forget to cite it. So I want to make sure that I remind everyone, yes, you still need to cite that quote, even if it's just a kicker quote at the end. Um, and also they sometimes want to overuse it. So if they're using a famous quote as a hook at the beginning of the intro paragraph, they are not allowed to use one as a kicker because that is just too much of a good thing. Okay, so here is what it's going to look like in real life. So on a previous video, I talked about intro paragraph structure and I used James Hurst's short story, The Scarlet Ibis, as our model. Again, if you haven't seen that, go back in time, click the link and go see that. Um, today I'm grabbing in the upper left hand corner the thesis from that video um, and I'm using it as the basis for what would launch into the conclusion. So I'm going to read the thesis, the original thesis to you, and then I'm going to get into the restatement so you can see the difference. Okay, original thesis. Ultimately, Hearst uses the complicated relationship between doodle and brother to show that love always contains some drops of poison. Hmm, compelling idea. And then I would have had my freshman spend one body paragraph talking about foreshadowing and then a second body paragraph analyzing the symbolic uses of red. There's like a red bird, Scarlet Ibis itself. Uh, the little brother is very like red. He's covered in blood when he dies. It's super sad. Uh, there's red leaves on the bush. The, the coffin is a mahogany redwood. So there's lots of red things happening in the story. So they would spend a body paragraph analyzing that. And then we're ready for the fourth paragraph, this conclusion. When one considers the story's elements of foreshadowing and symbolic use of various shades of red, it is clear that resentment is a common side effect of love. Every child is taught that hate is the opposite of love. Yet Hearst reveals that those two feelings are actually part of the same powerful emotion. Just as there can be no light without dark, the human heart can't help but create some bitterness as it seeks the sweetness of love. Oh, yeah. And then we have that nice end note where we sit and we mentally chew on that idea. And as I'm reading that, I'm thinking, is that true for my own relationships? And I'm, I'm sitting with that idea, which is a fresh lens of looking at what the theme of the story is. And that's what it's all about. That's what we want. We want to have an impact and help people see things in a different way. That's why we analyze these stories in the first place. All right, so there's an example of a literary analysis conclusion that works. On the next slide, I have one for argument writing, which is a totally different thing. Um, if you're familiar with my argument essay writing materials, this thesis in the upper left hand corner is going to look really familiar to you. In that packet, as we're doing prep work before kids start writing their own, I actually have them deconstruct both a pro and con essay on the topic of whether uh, energy drinks should be sold to minors. So like Red Bull and Monster, whether it's okay for people under 18 to buy those. So in one of those essays, this would be the, um, the essay against such legislation, we get this original thesis. Proposed laws to ban energy drink sales to minors are well-intentioned but short-sighted because the legislators' claims not only lack scientific support Support, but also insult responsible citizens. All right, and then we would spend, this would be a five paragraph essay, so you'll see what the three body paragraphs are in the restatement of thesis. When one considers the absence of scientific proof, the desire for fairness in the marketplace, and individual rights and responsibilities, it is clear that proposed laws to prohibit energy drink sales to minors should be defeated. In our country, it's difficult to change a law. The process encourages us to think through proposals and fully examine an issue before we ink a new rule that will govern all our lives. Perhaps English philosopher John Locke expressed this best when he reminded us that every new law must be designed not to abolish or restrain, but to preserve and enlarge freedom. And there's your solid end note. And then we're like, oh, John Locke. And we think about it. Um, notice here that I have the proper MLA 8th edition citation. I would leave this up on the slide 
and I have it on the student handout so that kids have a good model of what that would look like. And there you go. So this one was four sentences. The previous one on lit analysis was just three sentences. So kids can get this done in a really small amount of space on their paper. This last slide I have for you is actually a student handout. So I would give this to my kids as a reference tool for them to keep in their notebooks or their writing portfolios so they can refer back to it as they start writing their own conclusions on whatever essay I've given them. So the lit analysis is there and the argument and then they can sort of see how these are all pieced together and they also have a model of good MLA citation as well. So if you'd like a copy of those slides or the student handout just click down there there's a link where you can download everything. I want to thank you for the few minutes you spent here. Hopefully these tools are useful. If they are you can pay me back by giving me a like, subscribing to the channel, or just letting some of your English teacher friends know that we're here hanging out trying to solve problems. All right this is the last warm afternoon here in Idaho. Apparently it's supposed to rain tomorrow and then maybe that'll turn into snow. Uh, so I gotta go. Uh, enjoy the last few hours. I'm gonna put the cushions away. Uh, and I'll see you probably indoors next time. Bye everyone.